Hello AP Calc BC students, Mr. Record here taking a look at video three. We still are looking at another motion along a curve problem. This is our second uh, a full official problem. And I wanted to give you something that was just a little bit different that can give you some insight into the kinds of uh, problem styles. The motion of curve problem that we saw in example two did not require the use of a calculator at all. But this one is a little bit different as you can see. So if you don't have your calculator, you might wanna pause the video and grab it because you'll wanna follow along. There could be a few new things that I might share with you. Uh, I wanna make sure that you know that we are gonna be using the TI Inspire in this video. So if you're watching outside of Avon with the TID4, you can do a lot of the same things. It's just that the input will be a bit different. So why don't we take a look at this guy? Let me move myself up a little bit here. So what we've got going on here is a question that asks to sketch the path of the object that moves along the plane curve given by R of T is E to the TI plus ln of TJ. Now I wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy to try to sketch this without the use of technology because you just simply can't put together a T chart that would be all that effective, I suppose, in computing um, this particular uh, direction and um, path. Now, that being said, perhaps there is a clever way that one might be able to fashion um, a rectangular equation for this, and that's perfectly suitable in this problem, but I'm okay, I'm content right now with using a bit of technology to see what's going on. So the very first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna call up our graphing calculator, and I am going to make sure in my graph screen that I'm in my parametric graph entry mode. Now there's a way to do that uh, using the mode button on your TI-84, but you just wanna make sure that it's set to parametric. And then at this point, I'm gonna input E to the T, and then I'm gonna put natural log of T as my X and Y components. And I'm gonna, for just the time being, leave this stuff kind of as it is. And here's the reason. I know that this particular default setting is tailor-made for po uh, polar type of graphs because the 0 to 2 pi seems to indicate that. And we very often will use polar equations in the parametric world. Now, there's nothing wrong if we wanted to change that here. But if you look at this a little bit more carefully, you'll probably realize that there is a very strict domain restriction for the natural log of t. We studied those in a previous topic. We can't let t be zero, and we can't let t be negative numbers. So by leaving this at zero, we're essentially going to see what we would anticipate a very similar graph to if, if we put a negative number in. So I might experiment with that a little bit. Uh, I don't really see any reason why we can't change that to something larger than 6.28 or 2 pi. And the t-step size is always defaulted at 0.13, which is just a decimal abbreviation for pi over 24. So if I hit enter, let's see what we're looking at here. Interesting. Well, we see a curve that has pretty standard behavior, what we predict going on to the right side. But it's kind of crazy here. Is it stopping? Does it continue to go? That's a little bit interesting. So if we played around with it a little bit, maybe we allowed this t to go beyond negative zero or to zero. Let's see if this makes any differences. That was unexpected. <laughs> we added up seeing a little bit more of the curve, I guess. Well, there are sometimes just small anomalies with the graphing calculator that are somewhat unexplained. And maybe there is an explanation for this, and one of you might be able to do that as uh, better than I can. But even if I change this t-step, maybe I want to make it a little bit less than 0.13. It's going to put more points closer together. I don't really see much of a change there. In fact, it looked, if anything, it got a little shorter. So what we're going to have to understand is that there is something going on with this curve that we might intuitively have to figure out on our own. And one way that we could do that, I suppose, is call up a table of values, which is just a control T away on the TI Inspire. And then we can look here and see what the value is of our X, which, wow, those 
those are kind of decimal and icky looking. And then we could go over a column by pushing the right arrow, this button right here that I pushed, and we can see the values um, that we have for the Y. And what we'll notice is as the T value gets smaller, let me, let me start down here for a moment t equal 10. I'm at 2.3. But as the t gets smaller, my y value is getting smaller. Now the problem is, is that we never really got a chance to see what was happening in between our 1 and our 2. But I have a pretty sneaky suspicion that we are just going to be getting smaller and smaller even between 0 and 1. So if I set this table so that I could plug in values like 1 half, one fourth, one eighth, one tenth, we would notice that e to the one tenth power is the tenth root of e, which is probably going to produce a fairly small x value that's going to be positive. Let me say that again positive, but the y value is going to be something that we might have to look at on a calculator page. So let's try that. Let's say if we let t be 1 tenth. This would be our x value. Oh, it was kind of smart alecky there, wasn't it? <laughs> let's convert it to a decimal. So we're getting a value that's positive and bigger than 1, but our natural log is going to be negative 2.3. So we're actually going to be getting smaller and smaller. Let's play around with this. How about we go negative 1 over 100? And you can kind of tell that the more zeros we put here, the likely this is closing in on negative infinity. However, back up to the e to the 1 tenth, if we make that a 1 over 100, we're still never going to be to the left of 1. So the point I am trying to convey here is in our graph, let's show that graph one more time here. In our graph, we're actually looking at a vertical asymptote here at 1. We're looking at a place here on the x-axis that would be equivalent to 2.7, which is e. Think about when, when, when we cross this axis at some point, we probably had a time that was equivalent to 1, e to the first power is going to be 2.7. And it looks like we're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but we're doing so without bound. There is no horizontal asymptote. This y is, increase, is, excuse me, is increasing, but not nearly as fast as the x. It's a lot of things to consider, you guys, I know. But the, the fact remains is that you have to know that there's this vertical asymptote right here at 1. Notice the scale change as well. And you're going to have to be cognizant of the fact that 3 is right about here, so 2.7 would be maybe there. And so you're going to draw something that looks like this. Now because there is no scale factors along this particular curve, I wouldn't scrutinize so much uh, the curvature of this. I just want to make sure that your general shape is intact. And I think we also showed you from the table of values that the orientation, or let's double check, let's not just assume the orientation would be, control T, as the T values get larger, the X values are, look down here to see the decimal, getting larger as well. Now another cool way that you could do this if you have the TI Inspire 2, is that you could play the path plot for parametric. And you can see how this curve is going to be sketched. However, we're going to be waiting here an awful long time because I let my t value go all the way from negative 10. So instead, what I'm going to do is say, let's go back into this parametric equation here. Let's take a look at the settings on it and maybe change this back to zero so we can see it a little bit better. So now I'll push my trace path plot parametric 
watch the movie and you can see that we are definitely going from right to left. If you're using your TI-84, uh, there is a path plot uh, on that particular calculator. Um, and if you're using a TI Inspire 1, you will have to go into trace and graph trace and manually click the button so that it moves, clicking this button here. Okay, I think that's plenty of time devoted to sketching this graph. The rest of this should go a little bit more smoothly. Part um, B asks to find the velocity and acceleration vectors, and I actually am going to strike this at speed because we're going to be doing that in part D. So for the velocity vector, we are going to take the derivative, which is e to the t times i plus 1 over t times j. Right, Taking the derivative of those two components. And then the velocity at time 1 is going to be e to the first times i plus 1 over 1, which is 1 times j. All done with that. Acceleration vector. Take the derivative of e to the t once again, which, hey, it's e to the t again. It's always going to be e to the t. But if you take the derivative of 1 over t, you get negative 1 over t squared times j. Evaluate this at 1, and you get e to the first times i minus 1 over 1 times j. Moving on to part c. They want us to sketch those two vectors. And I think this is one of the trickiest parts of this question. And it has to do more with the scale change. Well, first of all, we need to figure out where time 1 is. And I think we could go back to the graph to do that. But if you remember our earlier conversation, if we were to have plugged in t equal 1 into a t chart, it should be clear that e to the first is e and natural log of 1 is 0, so we should be at the point E0, which just so happens to be right there. And so that's our t equal 1 point. Now for this vector that we're about to draw for the acceleration, we need to go over E units in the x direction and at the same time one unit up in the y direction. Now because this scale is so wonky, that's a very tricky thing to do. Because we're already at 2.7, well, to get to 4, right, and I'm just going to draw this x-axis here to kind of indicate what's happening. We're already here at 2.7. Well, we're going to have to travel 1.3 units, approximately, to get to 4. But since we need to go... 2.7 more units to the right of 2.7, I need a 1.4 more left. So what will happen is if 5 is right about there at the halfway point between this 4 and 6, five, um, 1.3 plus 1.4 <laughs> is going to be, well, let's see, there's 1, okay, and then if I go 0.4 more, it's going to land me right about 0.4, right about here maybe. So I should be, it looks like, halfway between the 5 and the 6, around there to really call this a length of E. And so I want to trace that as best I can, eyeball it up to where Y is 1, because that's the Y component of this vector. That is going to be what I want to draw. You just want to be a little careful here and not assume that the axis is measured in units of one because then you might go out two and some more and land over here. Now for the acceleration vector, the good news is it's very similar. You, you are going to go E in the X direction and down one in the Y direction. So essentially it's going to be on the same plane here Right, the same x distance over there and that same y value of negative 1 in this case, the same distance down instead of up. And that would take care of our two velocity vectors, or our, sorry, our velocity vector and our acceleration. As we are traveling along this amusement park ride, our body will have the sensation at this point that we want to keep moving in this straight direction, but the 
ride is going to curve us around. And then there's this force acting upon us that's kind of moving us inward there. It's sort of like a centripetal type of force, very similar to the one that we did in example number one. All right, we are going to now go ahead and find our speed. Our speed is always defined to be the square root of the sum of the squares of the components of the velocity. So that would be e to the t squared, which is e to the 2t, and then 1 over t squared, which is 1 over t squared. Now, that doesn't really answer our question yet because we want the speed specifically at time 1. And so if we replace t with 1, we should get e squared plus 1, all under a square root. Only one thing left to discuss. Part E. What's happening to the position, velocity, and acceleration as t approaches infinity? Well, there's a lot of different ways that we could probably word this. Let's think about position. Well, as t approaches infinity, what we see is the x value of the position is certainly getting larger. But as I indicated before, the y is getting larger as well. So we can say both um, the x and y components, or the x and y values, are increasing. Now, you could be a little bit more descriptive and say the x is increasing much faster than the y, but it's not really necessary. Now, what's happening to the velocity vector? Well, as we can see here, the velocity vector looks like this at time 1, but hmm, I wonder what it looks like, say, here or maybe here. And oftentimes, you may not want to look at the graph. Don't ever underestimate the fact that you have a velocity vector. I'm just essentially asking you to find the limit of the velocity vector as t approaches infinity. And so you can tell that the x component is going to grow to infinity while the y component becomes 0. So in essence, this vector is going to shorten up on the vertical end but grow longer horizontally. And so we would say as t approaches infinity, for velocity, I probably should have said in blue for position. Um, that wasn't real clear. I was relying on my color coding and figured the blue would be pretty obvious. But I'll say for the position, for r of t, both x and y are increasing. But for v of t, we'll say x is uh, approaching infinity where y is approaching 0. Okay? And then for the acceleration, we're going to handle that in a very similar way. For the acceleration, again, you see that the e to the t is going to cause x to approach infinity. But the 1 over t squared, even with the negative, is going to cause the y component to approach 0 again. And that takes care of a vector motion along a curve problem where we get a little bit of calculator intervention. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.